evening everyone and welcome to our evening service and great to see you, I can never see you but I know you're there so that's what's important. We're going to go straight into our first song this evening, Amazing Grace, and then Elaine is going to pray for us and then Mali is going to read the word of God and then we're going to have the message. God bless. pray together. Dear Father in heaven, help us all to be still and to know that you're God, to calm our bustling, chattering minds and anxious hearts. Father God, we your children thank you that we can meet tonight to praise, honour and worship you, our creator, sustainer, almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God. Though you're a God of justice, you treat us all with undeserved mercy, compassion and endless amazing love through your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your life, your suffering, death and glorious resurrection by which our sins are forgiven and we can truly live as children of God. We come to you, O Lord, recognizing our need of you whether we've been a follower of you for many years or are new to the christian faith or as yet do not know and understand the message of salvation this evening and through this season of lent 
please draw each of us into a much deeper, closer and intimate relationship with you. Teach us to truly obey the commands to love you with all of our hearts and minds and strength and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Please continue your ongoing work in each of us. You know everything about us, our strengths, areas of weakness, our joys and our sorrows, our talents and challenges, things which we rejoice about and things of which we're ashamed. Everything is known to you. Lord, we seek your plans for us always and we long to submit to your will. We can't do anything good in our own strength and we ask you again to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us as your church here in Barry to do with joy the good work which you have prepared in advance for us to do knowing that in serving others, we are serving you. We thank you for our pastors, Matt and Brian, and we ask you to bless and strengthen them in their ministry here. Tonight, help us to listen attentively to the Bible readings and message as Brian brings God's word to us. May we treasure your words and may it bring forth much fruit for your praise and your honour and your glory alone, Lord. Amen. Reading from 1 Timothy 3.16 Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in it in the world was taken up in glory instruction to timothy the spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirit spirits and things taught by demons such a teaching come through hypocr hypocritical liars whose con consciences have been seared was with a hot iron they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be reject, to rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point those things out to the brothers, you will be good minister of Christ Jesus. Brought up in the truth of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is trustworthy saying that deserve full exceptions and for this we labour and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all men and especially of those who believe. Amen. Well, you can see there that we asked Mali also to read 1 Timothy 3.16 and the reason i done that, the main message will be in 1 Timothy 4 and we see in 1 Timothy 4 there's a faith that has been abandoned, a wrong teaching that has been embraced but then Jesus again comes with the truth and says right there's a right teaching, there's a right way forward but 3.16 really just reminds us what it's all about and it says beyond all question the mystery of godliness is great he appeared in the body was vindicated by the spirit was seen by angels was preached among the nations was believed on in the world and was taken up in glory and that's the big picture that's how we're to be godly in chapter 4 we're going to see the, what godliness is and that people want to be godly and we're to train ourselves to be godly but before we train ourselves to be godly we need to know what godliness is and that's the message you believe that it's happened, it's glorious. 
that Jesus Christ appeared in the flesh. He came and He lived this life and He died on the cross for your sins. And the Bible says that the Spirit testified it. In other words, the Holy Spirit confirmed this. Remember when Jesus is baptized, this is my Son who I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and um, rested on Christ. And that it's being seen by angels. In other words, heaven is a witness that they watch this and seen that this is the Christ. This is the one who's been sent by heaven. Heaven's seen him. Say, yeah, we saw, we saw him going down, as it were. We saw. We're all witnesses. We've seen it, and it's been preached among the nations and believed. And it's kind of like this. It's kind of saying that yeah, the earth has seen it, and heaven has seen it. They've witnessed that this is what your hope is. This is what your hope should be should be in and is in and only can be in this is the hope of having a hope in the living god the one who's took on flesh and lived amongst us and you think that nobody would move away from this but and that's where we get into chapter 4 verse 1 it says the spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits things taught by demons and it's interesting, people will leave this and move to things taught by the devil, basically. We've seen it with Peter this morning, isn't it? Peter tells Jesus, um, basically, don't go to the cross. Do not deny, do not deny yourself, Jesus. Do, you know, just self-indulge. Indulge. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And, you know, it was like Peter was thinking like the devil at that moment. And we can be like that. We can want something, but we end up acting like the devil and if you never saw that that was Matt was preaching on that this morning how that experience with Peter and Jesus and Peter was a faithful follower of Jesus but yet in that moment he was thinking like the devil and we think about Saul in the Bible how he consulted a witch near the end of his life we think about Balaam who couldn't curse the people of God even though he got paid money and eventually he just taught the, the nations around them, how to entice them, how to teach them to eat certain foods that were sacrificed to idols and sexual immoralities. But here the, the, the demons will teach people to forbid them to marry and forbid them to eat certain foods. So it's interesting, demons will teach some people to do something, but they also teach other people not to do something. So there's this both active work and also inactive work, which both are sin really and both are demonic. And the thing is it looks virtuous, it looks good, but it comes from hypocritical liars. It comes from people that are asking you to jump a certain height that they're not jumping themselves. And it comes from, you know, the Bible says that they're... they're Conscience has been seared with a hot iron. It's like they had the, the heat of the sin. It's just burnt them inside. They're, basically, their head is wrecked. Their head's not in the right place, Jesus is saying. They're, something's wrong with their head. And that their conscience, the place where they should be honest and forthright, has been burnt and heated with all the lies inside of them. But yet, they're the people, these hypocritical liars who are asking you to jump a certain height that they're not jumping themselves. And that's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how they want you to forbid something, they want you to abstain, but they're not doing it themselves. They're not keeping to their rules or laws. Jesus said that about the Pharisees. You tell people not to steal, yet you steal. You tell people not to commit adultery, but yet you commit adultery. And the Bible warns us not to be blown and tossed by every wind and teaching and by the cunning craftiness of men and people and their deceitful scheming. But I said, don't be blown away from this. All these new fads are a new way of doing something. And many times it just gets you away from the simple truth, the simple message that you heard that Jesus Christ came in a body and died on the cross for your sins and that that blood is enough for your forgiveness of your sins and to be right for all eternity. That's the message you heard. That's the message you believed in. But yet they're the people that are demanding people, forbidding people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believed and who know the truth. 
Since then, marriage and food is almost like the two basic enjoyable things of life. Get you know, you, somebody gets married and they have a good meal, but not you're forbid. You know, forbid is such a strong language. It's almost like you really can't do that, or abstain. Like you know, it, push back. Don't have this food, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And so God's they're saying. You know, maybe they're saying singleness makes you close to God. You hear that, isn't it? If you're single, if you don't marry, you're going to be really close to God. You're going to be, you're going to be like an elite Christian. You know, you'll, you might hear God in a, a much more advanced way. Other people will hear like distorted God's voice, but you'll hear in like really high definition. You know, you might even get to see angels or, you know, special uh, mission trips that will be just for you in your singleness. Or not eating certain food, and maybe you're thinking, maybe they're teaching that don't don't eat this because this is you know um, well is not helpful for you to draw close to God, and you'll be a much purer inside, as if that food is what cleanses you from sin, and not the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting how all these things are moving you away from Jesus Christ, and they abstain from things that they should be thankful about. That's interesting, isn't it? That actually I'm saying no to things that God is saying, this is, I'm giving you this to enjoy. You should, this should be, this is like your thankful place. This is, this is be something that stirs up thankfulness in you. But yeah, you, you learn, you're thinking that this is actually going to make you closer to me. And actually it's, probably, it's doing the reverse then, isn't it? Because the thankfulness would make you closer. The, God is created for, actually for me, it was made so that I can receive it and I can know the truth about it, I can know its goodness and I can have it and enjoy it, but yet I'm putting this wrong self-denial towards it. It says, for everything that God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. And that's, even the word of God and prayer are testifying that it's okay. But it's like you, we go over God's head and think, oh, I know better. I, like, I, I prayed about it, God, and you've reassured me that it's okay. I've looked at the word of God, you've reassured me that it's okay. But no, there must be something more. There must be. And you, there's like that with teachings, isn't it? New teachings. You always feel like there's, there's something deeper. Oh, there's, yeah, there's, no, I know what the Bible says. I know what we've prayed, but no, there's something about this. There's something deeper. The Bible talks about that itching ears, isn't it? I want, no, this, I'm still not convinced. I'm not content. I'm not satisfied with what God has said. Even though prayer and the word of God have declared them to be good. Even though the Bible has shown that I can receive this. I can be thankful about it. I can know that it's good. I can know the truth about it. I can know it's goodness. It says, for everything God created is good, and nothing is to be read that verse, sorry, verse 6. If you point these things up to the brothers, you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truth of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wife's tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training has some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for for both the present life and the life to come. So it's saying, of course, physical training, getting yourself in good shape, that's, that's good for you, that's healthy, that'll have some value, it'll add to you. But the thing that's really going to add to you is godly, being godly. And the mystery of godliness is great. How do you be godly? It's through Jesus. It's through your faith in Christ. I trust in Jesus. I trust God to make me godly. You can't be godly without God, yet God has come in the flesh, in Jesus. As we learned this morning, we don't go above that. There's not above revelation. That he's come in the flesh. I put my trust in Jesus. I believe in him, and I am made godly. I, and I put my hope in him. It says here, for physical training is some value, but godliness has value for all things. Holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so we could see it like this. The godliness is like, I'm godly because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. I'm become Christ-like because Jesus makes me Christ-like. So it's saying there'll always be value 
for trying to look like Jesus. There'll always be value constantly wanting to be Christ-like. There'll always be a... And that'll be valuable in everything. It's always valuable looking to what Jesus Christ has done and how he changes you. And that will hold promise for both the present life. That will help now and that's going to help in the life to come. That is it. Well, what about forbidden marriage? What about abstaining from certain foods and they're not going to make me godly? What about this new teaching that this person told me to, to really be strict in this area? Is that not going to make me godly? And I think we get to the place where it really shows, it says, well, you're going to have to train yourself to be godly. So if I'm going to train, I need to know how to do it. You know, you can't ask me to train to be godly and not show me how to do it. And it says here, this is a trustworthy, and this is, I believe the Holy Spirit is showing you, this is how you do it. This is a trustworthy sin that deserves full acceptance, and for this we labor and strive. So he's saying, look, in an environment where things aren't trustworthy, in an environment where there's new teachings and, you know, they might look attractive and like look virtuous, they might look holy, they might look godly, they might look complicated and intelligent and really advanced and you can move towards it because you, 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 you're desperate to be godly. You see, some, the, just to back up a bit, is the problem with some of these things, it, it's from people that might want to be godly or think they want to be godly that they're going into these things. Like I said, demons teach you to do some things, but also demons teach you not to do some things. And the channel that we use is people, they'll speak through people who are basically, their head's not in the right place, their head's in the wrong place. And it's misdirected zeal, the Bible calls it. The Pharisees had it. They read the Bible, they prayed, but their zeal was misdirected. And they, and they put their focus and their a passion, like a laser focus on doing certain attributes, thinking that they'll get life from them, but they was getting no life from them. But Paul says here, the Holy Spirit says, this is where your hope is. For this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. For this we labor and strive that we put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all men and especially of those who believe. He's saying this is something you can put all your money in the bank. You can fully accept it. Don't let it find any barrier. It's completely trustworthy. You can put your whole life, on, your soul on it. Everything in this, your, the way you live, your family, your work, everything is completely trustworthy. And not only is it trustworthy, it's proven, but it, it is, needs full acceptance. You need to embrace it. If you see any part of yourself not embracing it, you see any part of yourself pushing back, you've got to say, no, I've got to fully embrace it. What have you got to fully embrace? That we have put our hope in the living God. Hope is this, things are going to get better because Jesus is alive. I've put my hope in the living God. The living God, who is he? Well, he's the one who talks for a start. He's the one who hears your voice. He's the one who can walk and move and hold you. He's the one who has power and authority. He's, the, he's that living God that called you out, out of Egypt, the Bible says. It took you out of slavery. He's that living God. He's that living God who put a song in your heart. He's the living God who spoke truth and counseled you through all your difficulties. He's the living God who quietened you with his love. He's that living God. That's the one you've put your hope in. Don't listen to the old wife's tales and the godless myths. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to say, that is where my hope is. Don't listen to the nonsense. Don't listen to the stupid. They sound advanced. It sounds amazing. It sounds really like, oh, of course, I want to be the super prophet that can prophesy and do all these things. I want to be one of these where I can lay my hands on people and people are raised from the dead. I, I want these sort of things. We can be attracted to him and say, no, you put your hope in the living God. You put your ho hope in the one who came in flesh and died on that cross. That's what you've believed in. That I was a sinner before God. I was lost and I was broken. And God says, trust in me. I'll make you godly. Oh, but God, I'm a sinner. God, I have wrong thoughts. God, I'm, I'm not in the right place. You don't understand who I am. I'm, I'm wrong inside. I'm... I'm filthy inside, I'm, I'm 
I'm broken inside. I'm all messed up. God, you don't understand that I'm really, I'm, I'm really m messed up. God, how can you say I'll make you God? How can you say I can change you? It says, you put your hope in me. You put your hope in what I've done that cross. You put your hope that that blood is enough to forgive you. You put your hope that this can change you and this can help you. That this can wash away all that filthiness you'd see inside. That it can f give you a sound mind. You put your hope in that. You Don't put your hope in all the... That's what basically the Holy Spirit saying. Don't put your hope in old wives' tales and things that look fancy and never... You can't... You know, it's just stupid or godless myths, you know, things that m sound attractive. Don't put your hope in that. You labour and strive to say, I'm going to put my hope... And there, it's humbling coming to the cross, isn't it? Because there's nothing you can add to it. It's humbling because it's it's not of your own work. If it's your own work, you can boast about it. You can say, well, I, I did a little bit and I did this. You can't boast about anything. You've got to simply say, I am a sinner and I'm completely reliant on God's love and mercy to forgive me and to help me. And that's why we labour and strive it. But it's a trustworthy saying. It deserves full acceptance. What's trustworthy is that it's, tr it's right for you to put your hope there. It, you can trust that, that hope will come good. You can trust that the things that you're hoping to get better will get better simply because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. It deserves full acceptance. That you have put your hope in the living God who is the saviour of all men. It's, it's trustworthy because he's the one who can save all men. He's the one who can save you, rescue you. He can take you out of that dark place and bring you into light. He can take you out of that dangerous place and bring you into a safe place. And it says he was the saviour of all men and especially of those who believe. It's almost like saying, and of course from those who believe. He saves people and he, and he especially saves those who trust him. He saves every, he can save everyone. And of course he saves, he especially saves those who want that salvation. That salvation is offered to everyone. And he, he can especially save those who say, yes, I want that Jesus. You see, you, you didn't come with lots of things offering God. You didn't come with them sort of things saying, I can be like this. You, you didn't say, God, look at me because of my merits and what I do. You didn't come like that. You came lost and broken. You came knowing that you were on your way to hell, almost being condemned to hell forever. You, you came knowing that I can't fix this. I can't change this. Why do you need to move from that place? Why do you think you, what, do you move to some more advanced level? <laughs> Yes, we grow in wisdom, but we grow because of that. From that seed, that's what your hope is in. The living God who spoke to you, he showed you he was real. He showed you he can really help you. Real problems need a real God, and you've got a real God. You've got the living God. Don't put your hopes in what you can do. Put your hopes in the fact that you can get up in the morning, and you can pray and talk to him, and he'll speak to you. Through his word and through prayer, he can, he'll communicate to you what is right and wrong. Put your hope in that. Sometimes maybe we made it complicated. Maybe that's why we like these other things. Because we want this ability to deny and to boast. And maybe that's why we're attracted to the fanciness of all the different teachings. All the new, new teachings that go about. Because we can then say, well, it's more, uh, you, you, know, you know about the cross, you Christians, but I've got the cross plus this advanced teaching. And it makes us smarmy and it makes us, it makes us, oh, what can, how can we fellowship? Come on. No. Labour and strive to keep putting your hope in the simple gospel truth. That you were a sinner saved by Jesus. By his blood. And all these fancy new revelation, end time teachings and all that sort of stuff. Just put it aside. It's, it's, it's screwing up your head because their, their heads are screwed up. 
and don't listen to it anymore and just come back to the cross as a sinner and say, Jesus, is this enough? Is this blood enough? And Jesus will say, yes, it is enough. And you, you've got to see what all this means now. You've got to understand that you're blessed in the heavenly realms. You've got to see that I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That is where I put my hope. That's where, as it were, I put all my money in the bank, all my security, all my family, everything is in there. Jesus has died for me on the cross. I didn't come all advanced and intelligent and noble. I came broken, confused, lost, didn't know which direction my life was going in. I came filled with addictions, filled with hate, filled with lies, filled with so many wrong things inside, so many wrong teachings probably taught by demons. But no, now I'm saying this, I put my hope in God will change me. God will fix me. God will cleanse me. God will forgive me. God has given me a hope and a future, a secure place. He's taken my feet into a, a broad place because he delights in us through Christ. His smile is upon us because of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you, it says. May his smile be upon you because of the blood and know that smile. Know him as a father. Know him as that good father who cares for you. Know him as the good shepherd and all the truth that comes from his word. And all the blessings that were promised to Abraham are yours because your faith is in him. Your faith is in him. You put your hope that he saves lost people. You've put your hope in that he saves sinners. Keep it there. Forget the rubbish. We're not going to preach. We're going to preach the rubbish to this town. No, they need to know he saves. He can save anybody. He can save the worst of sinners. He saves them. His blood was spilled. The Father is pleased. Don't move from that place. <laughs> There's no joy. That's where the joy is. That's where the peace is. That's where the hope is. Don't move from that place. He can fix you. Trust Him. Trust the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. But in all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. For this is what we labour and strive that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, and especially of those who believe. I put my hope in the saviour. You put your hope there and keep it there. Don't abandon your faith for things that look godly, but don't produce anything. It come from people that are messed up in the head and really come from demons. You simply trust the truth. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. His blood has been shed and that makes me righteous with God. I've turned from my sins, I repented and I've turned to that. I've turned to Jesus. God bless you and take care. Amen.
Hey